Hey, when was the last time I even posted a video, right? Oh my goodness! So I started my hiatus to work on a zine, which I already told you guys about multiple times. I finished the zine, the big collaborative one that's like 80 pages long, and I made a video about it that's 50 minutes long. And I was super proud of it. I was like, I'm just gonna take a little bit of a longer break to kind of like settle down, focus on what I want to do next, then get back to making videos. And it has been months and months and months. <laughs> Let's just say a lot has happened in my personal life and also on the internet, which made me not want to go on it for months and months. Nothing personal. I like literally haven't even interacted with anybody or read any comments or done really anything in the past four or five months having to do with social media. I just, I suddenly started hating it for what I thought was no reason and it turned out to be a very good reason. So more on that later. I have a book. I have a book. It has a goodwill tag if it'll focus. It's got a goodwill tag on it, so that means uh, nobody wanted it. It's rated Y for Youth, 7 and up. Uh, this is the artwork for it. <laughs> I found this on eBay for $2 because I like to look for graphic novels that are cheap. Usually, I can find some pretty good ones for cheap. I found a lot of my favorites for very cheap. However, there's a lot of garbage on there, like a lot, and I found that and I kept passing by it all the time and I was like, what is this? What is this book? It looks like early 2010s DeviantArt stuff. And I had to get it. And I was right, it is early 2010s. It's literally released in the year 2010. And it is interesting enough to hazard its own video. So let's talk about that. Okay, I have a script. I'm gonna go off the script now. That was all unscripted, as you could very obviously tell, because I'm a stammering fucking idiot mess. I like graphic novels. I like them because blocks of text make my brain hurt, and I'll read pages and pages and pages without realizing I retained literally none of the information. Which sucks, because I'm a writer, and you know what that means? I have trouble reading my own writing. So, what's the next step for somebody who loves books, but developed chronic brain rot after high school? Obviously graphic novels, but they cost quite a bit of money because of printing fees. I should know. I made a video on this. I will release it later. The easiest way to add books to my collection is just going to half price books, eBay, local bookstores, Goodwill, etc. And picking up some of the discounted stuff they have, hoping it's good. Of course, that means there's going to be some real bad ones in the mix. The ones that make you go, oh, so that's why it was two dollars. But you know, I don't go out looking for bad comics. I don't go out wanting to hate a comic. I want stuff I can read and like, and it'll grow on me. But this comic, <laughs> let me introduce you to Royal Icing. What is this? What year is it? Who put this person's Sailor Moon DeviantArt fanfiction into a book format and why was it just $2 on eBay? Well, I'm here to tell you because this is an interesting case compared to the last people I've talked about. We got like, Mike Chenoweth, Crystal's 1986, the creator of Master Lee. They're all enigmatic figures who have barely any information about them, if any, and have all dropped off the face of the earth. Meanwhile, this artist, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce her name. But she is currently active on Twitter and Amazon. She's still putting stuff out there. I usually stick to people who've come and gone because I feel much more comfortable knowing I didn't possibly ruin somebody's career with my video. Not like that's ever gonna happen because, you know, not enough people watch them, but I do worry. But I'm making an exception for this comic because look at it. Look at it. I found this thing in the wild. I'll start with some backstory about the book itself before picking apart the art and the story. Royal Icing is a manga or... It's not really a manga. I mean, it's not formatted like one. It's just like the art style, I guess. I'm just gonna call it a comic. I don't care. Royal Icing is a comic written by somebody named either Jury or Yuri Renee. My copy dates back to 2010, but she's marketing this book even recently along with her newer books. This one says that this is her first book, but she says that she's been writing comics for years prior. She has a Facebook that hasn't been updated in 10 years, a DeviantArt that's been abandoned for four years, and she seems to only have a presence on Twitter and Amazon solely to post about her book. Like, I think every single post on there is about her book. I mean, I can kind of relate, especially as of lately. Um, I'm a pretty secretive person unless you ask me about my projects, in which case I will crawl out of the woodwork to tell you why anthro-lesbians are the best topic to write about. 
From the author's bio, we can see that she went to art school, was born in 1979, which weirds me out because that's the same year as my mom, so I'm just imagining my mom wrote this book. Attends anime conventions and lives in San Francisco as of 2010. She likes Sherlock Holmes and anime as well as baking, which those are the three most like Tumblr things I've heard in my life as an ex-Tumblr user. So I'm wondering if she had some sort of like blog or something. Other than that, all I bothered to gather is that she's made a few other books which seem to be Yuri and Magical Girl related. Oh, I, I don't know about you guys, but Yuri has kind of been ruined for me by creepy neckbeards that think that lesbians only exist to be ogled, so here's to hoping her new works are not like that because God knows we need more of that in the world. Back on topic, royal icing is targeted towards children and just keep that in mind as I talk about this because there are some not kid-friendly elements in this I'd like to talk about. The last thing I found was this poorly shot YouTube video about how she makes her art. Let's just kind of sit back and watch this for a second to get an idea of what the art in this book is like. Wow, and here I am thinking that I was a slow artist. I mean, granted, she could just be nervous because somebody's shoving a camera right in her face, but if I spent that long drawing a single eye, I don't know, man. I don't I don't know where I'd be at art-wise. Okay, it's time. I've been recording for like 12 minutes and I haven't even gotten to the book itself. Okay. If you're interested, she's actually posted it to a site called Tapas. So on that site, you can read it without scouring eBay to find a $2 copy like I did. So if you want to read it, you can. It's all free. You can just go look at it. That's where I'm getting these scans from. All right, well, the back of the book reads... Adventure, mystery, romance, and other sweet surprises. Ooh. When little Emily bakes a cake, she gets more than she bargained for. Strange flora and fauna, a cold-hearted prince, and a mist... I swear to God this clock goes off like every two mi- I swear to God. Strange flora and fauna, a cold-hearted prince in a mystery that must be solved before she can return home from the Sucre Isles. What adventures await her in the land of curious candies? Contains all four chapters plus an artist bio and extra dessert recipes rated Y for youth 7 and up. Is any of that true? Uh, sort of. Kinda. Okay, the book opens with- the contents of this book may not be reproduced without the artist's permission. Well, uh, us YouTubers have a little thing for that. It's called fair use, and usually YouTube doesn't care, but I'm gonna put it up on the screen anyway. But what that means is basically I can show pieces of this if I'm critiquing it. The book opens with the pretty lazy introduction of our main character, Emily. She just kind of announces to the camera that she's 11 years old and that it's her mom's birthday instead of letting us infer that with context in the dialogue. So she decides to bake a cake for her mom. That's her only gift and it sucks, but she puts it in the oven and it magically disappears. So what's the most logical step if you put something in a hot oven and it vanishes? You climb the fuck in, I guess, because she just goes on in there in that hot oven that was just turned on. She's like, whoa, where's the cake at? And then she ends up tumbling into like a grassy plains area. The first thing she sees is some yellow water and decides to drink it, discovering it's actually lemonade. Like, yeah, kid, drink from the piss river. That's a great idea. And it tastes like piss. Swiss miss instant piss. This whole book is just full of great ideas so far. And then she just goes around picking up dirt and rocks and stuffing it into her face, realizing it's all made of candy. I was kind of hoping she'd run into like one real rock and just shatter all of her teeth, but I'm kind of evil, so. As she's eating, she steps in a pie and proceeds to eat the foot pie and gets caught in the act by this knight that looks like he was drawn for a completely separate book altogether. They ambush and capture her, accuse her of being an annoying little shit who steals ground pies and takes her to their castle to be judged by King Ganache himself. Once they arrive, the main knight announces that she's been stealing the king's personal tart. She defends herself and is about to be fucking backhanded by this adult man that she doesn't know when the king asks her to explain herself. She says she has no idea that those are the king's tarts and begs forgiveness. He shuns her, saying he's running out of patience and storms off before randomly turning around and being all like, Oh, whatever, it's fine, you cute little dumpling who can do no wrong. I'd never put a child in the dungeon. 
This is just a taste of what's to come. Because this is my main issue with this book right here. I'll get back to this later. She decides that she wants to track down the tart thief and bring them to justice. The king assigns her to work with his son, Prince Popover, who finds the tarts to be incredibly special since they're made with his dead mom's favorite berries, hemlock berries. But literally like not even two seconds after they're introduced, he sees the berry stain on her clothes, grabs her and just smacks her right in the head like, dude, calm down. Everyone just needs to chill. I hate kids as much as the next person, but don't just go around smacking them left and right. He shouts for the guards to quote unquote, lock her away until her body rots and that because of her, his mother will cry in her grave. Rated Y for youth, people. He proceeds to try and punch her again before the author remembered the king is in the same room and stops him, telling him to chill out and try to help find the real thief. Which I'm kind of confused because she confessed to eating the pie, so why would they think there's another thief? Because she already confessed- whatever. It doesn't matter because it's time for child abuse to make another appearance because the king smacks the shit out of his own child and it's just like, Get out of here and find the thief, you little- I don't know, I can't think of an insult. I'm, I'm just bewildered by the fact that this book exists. Uh, this is all within the first 30 pages. This prompts yet another freak out from the prince who realizes that he's working together with Emily. He already knew that, but suddenly he forgot and is mad all over again. I'm just gonna skip past this, this goes on for a while. It's revealed that the hemlock berry tarts the prince loves so much are laid out on his mother's altar after being baked and are poisonous to wild animals. Only humans can eat them. Remember that, because it's very obvious that this is a setup, just keep that in mind. And with no transition whatsoever, it's suddenly a Sherlock Holmes reference with a page-long explanation for what the quote, the game's foot comes from. Like, yes, I, I definitely needed that. That adds so much to the story, thank you. That goes nowhere for some reason, like why even have that if it doesn't do anything for the plot? And Emily tries to warm up to Prince Popover by saying she can relate to the loss of his mom by saying, if somebody tried to eat the cake I made for my mom, I'd be sad too. It's not helpful, but it's still sweet in a little kid kind of way, right? Wrong, because he gets mad again. He gets all pissy about the fact her mom is still alive so she can't possibly know how he feels. She gets mad and yells back and suddenly he's like, oh wow, forgive me, I'm so sorry, I'll never do that again. And they drop it until they go down to the riverside and find a bunch of dead animals. What is happening? You know, they set up earlier that the animals are the only ones not immune to the hemlock berry poison, so it's pretty easy to see where this is going. They're all dead with no exterior wounds, so yeah, it's safe to assume that's what's going on. Well, um, that plot point never comes up again. It doesn't go into the main plot at all. It's just like, whoa, they're dead. They ate the berries. Okay, moving on. They run back to the castle to report that there's dead animals everywhere, and then this ugly ass kid, whose eyes take up his I entire skull, eyes. is holding some of the sacred tarts. Popover freaks out, and this time it's Emily's turn to be a little bitch because she just shouts, If I was your mom, I'd smack you! And he threatens to cut her tongue out? Is this... is this all moving too fast for you? Because this all happens within a very short time frame, and I'm getting the worst emotional whiplash from it, but... You know, it's my video, I have to continue, even though I just want to kind of stop and just lay in bed for a while. The prince says that now that the little kid has come to the castle to atone for his crimes against Tartmanity, their partnership is over and she has to leave. And what is the next logical thing to do after you and your love interest get into a fight and you're told to leave? Obviously, threaten to take your life, apparently. <laughs> like, damn, if I wanted to read about somebody trying to get their crush to stay around by threatening to yeet themselves off a bridge, I'd go hit up Redacted. Except Emily actually does throw herself off a bridge. So Popover runs to catch her and the scene is interrupted by this random explanation of the characters' names that was completely unnecessary and it like actually made me laugh because of how out of place it was. No, I'm just gonna go die now, whoa. Then she falls off a bridge and the dude's like, no, oh! and then suddenly it cuts to, did you know that all their names are bakery names? Like Popover? Oh, it's like, oh, okay. She's dangling up the side of the bridge and Popover's holding on tight. These absolutely hideous guards run up to save her, which to be honest, if I saw these dudes running at me, I would just let go and let the void reclaim me. But suddenly Popover's all overprotective and in love with her again. Did I mention they're supposed to be in love? It was established earlier, but I, it didn't fit into the script and I don't care. So yeah, just think about that. They're in love or whatever, but you would not be able to tell without the text telling you, Oh, he's so hot, man. Wanna be his girlfriend, ooh. 
And would you guess what happens next? If you guess they get into another argument, you are correct because suddenly Emily is cold to him and Bard just passes him to... I, I don't know. She's just going to the castle, I guess. And then Popover goes to his room to monologue about, am I really doing the right thing by killing everybody who eats the tarts? Would my mom be proud of me? Which, you know, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I guess I can suspend my disbelief since it's been established that only royalty is allowed to eat the tarts, so... I used to be very literal about the way I interpreted media. It's just one of the things about having autism. That's kind of how your brain works. I'm trying to work on that for the sake of my videos though, because I'm so embarrassed about my videos where I'm like, huh, whoa, this doesn't happen in real life. This is the worst book ever. But it's like, no, my brain is too literal. I have to unlearn how to do that. So I can believe that there is a weird candy kingdom where the tarts are sacred and anybody who eats them dies. But my response to that is, you have to keep up the rules of your universe, keep it consistent so it's believable. This comes back later, again. Another thing I don't like about this book, moving on. It cuts to Emily in the dungeon who approaches the kid from earlier who confessed to eating the tarts, who coincidentally reveals that he stole the tarts for his own mother who is tired of eating vegetable soup. Uh, a valiant effort, I suppose. The mom is just like, oh god, no, you little idiot, I don't want that, get out of here with that, when he brings the tart in. So he went to return it and was mobbed by animals, which I thought that plot point would pay off in some way, but no, that's literally it. It's just like, whoa, you got attacked by animals, and then they ate the tarts, whatever. That's literally it. How did that advance the story at all, actually? Ugh. Ugh. Either way, that never gets brought up again, but now Emily's telling Popover that they have to free the kid because he was just trying to feed his mom and wasn't stealing intentionally. I guess maliciously would be a better word for it, but they decide to run to the kid's house for some reason, which isn't stated. Turns out this whole trip through the outskirts of the kingdom was literally just so Popover could feed the kid's mother a single hemlock berry and leave. Okay. Well, he leads Emily to the hemlock berry bush, which I swear to God is just a grayscale clip art of a tree. I, I burst out laughing when I realized the sacred berry bush was just a stock image. Emily reaches out to the JPEG bush and she gets pricked by a thorn and just passes out instantly. Like what? I thought humans were immune to the poison? They retreat to the JPEG stock image castle and Popover argues with his dad about whether to share the berries with the villagers, whether or not to. Ganache is like, bro, they're poisonous, man. Nobody should eat them. And then Popover says that the queen would hate them for keeping the berries a secret. And then there's this really awkward line about how a boy's love for his mother has turned to a man's love for a woman, which I don't think that was supposed to sound like he has an Oedipus complex, but I'm just going to assume that's canon now. And then they just kind of like realize, whoa, there's a cure for hemlock berry poisoning in a book somewhere and they send everybody out to look for it. Meanwhile, Emily is just laying in bed in a feverish slumber and she has dialogues such as Hot, sticky, warm, weak, scared, uncomfortable, twinge, fever, gas, breathe, sigh, where is my mother, where is my prince, need water, help me, help me. So in her feverish slumber, she's having a dream where she meets Queen Madeline who hands her a tart, basically saying, Thanks for helping my son become less of a little shit, and is woken up by Popover, who randomly has a bag of the medicine on standby. Now Emily is magically better because of the dream tart. Whoa, what was the point of the medicine? Are you noticing a trend here of plot points that go nowhere? She tells Popover that Queen Madeline was the one who gave her the tart, and shows that somehow there's just another half of a tart just sitting on the table. It gets all sappy and emotional or whatever, and for the first time in the entire book, what is this like? It's over, uh, it's about 100 pages in, and they finally like each other at the same time. However, it is very short-lived, because Emily begins vanishing from the saccharine, horrid, candy hell dimension, and Popover makes a face I can only describe as the one face from Sonic Adventure, where he's like, Watch out! You're, you're gonna, gonna crash! crash. Ah! ah! That one. He looks like that. Popover begs her not to go, but as she fades away, he tells her that he'll find her in the next world, which is kind of creepy. Either way, she wakes up on the kitchen floor to find her mom insulting her for sleeping on the tile. Apparently, what happened in real life is she left the oven on and passed out while waiting for the cake to bake, so the mom just made it for her. It was all a dream! Whoa, that's so original, guys! Nobody has ever done that before in a story, whoa! It randomly skips to her as an 18-year-old in culinary school, who has this long romantic speech that he's been saving for seven years after their first interaction. I like to think he just had it like in a cue card in his pocket for seven years. So she's all like, do I know you? And he's like, 
Yes, I do. I know you very well. I know your face, your voice, and the way you touched my heart. Since I was a child, I knew I would meet you, for we have met before. I saw you in my dreams from a distant memory of my former existence, and in that life, I made a promise, as your prince. And now, at long last, I finally found you, my lady. Holy shit, my dude, that is creepy as fuck. I am getting out of here. And that's the end. That's it. So, I'm going to try to format these videos a little differently, where I talk about three main points. What I hated, what I liked, and then what I would fix. So, let's do that. Okay, what works about Royal Icing? For better or for worse, the characters do feel like children, unlike something like Assigned Male, where the children talk like adults and the adults talk like children. Admittedly, it's because in this story the kids speak in simple, short sentences and are whiny and argumentative, but I feel like that's how 99% of kids are at any given point. I like the premise of finding a candy-themed world in your oven. It's, it feels like Gregor the Overlander, if anybody read that book series. It kind of reminds me of that whole finding a world hidden in your house plot point. Like Coraline comes to mind as well, but I felt like that was a little too obvious. Still, that works. I would keep that. Three, the plot itself is actually pretty decent. Like the plot itself in theory on paper. I read a lot of indie comics and the one thing that bothers me with like 80% of them is how there usually doesn't feel like there's an actual plot and if there is, it's minimal or has little payoff. It applies to some big name projects a lot of people worked on as well, but it usually affects indie comics from what I've seen, so that's pretty disappointing because I love indie comics, I'm an indie comic writer, but most of them seem to go nowhere. However, this book does actually have a tangible plot and I appreciated that because usually I hate reading books where nothing happens because it's like, why did I even read this? Four, the setting feels like a kingdom. The world building is kind of alright and I can tell where things are spatially as if they're laid out on a map. Sometimes it's hard to do that with comics since, you know, the artists will come up with ideas as they go instead of planning stuff out beforehand with like concept art, but I can kind of imagine the kingdom in maybe like the top left corner of a map and then the forest is kind of in the middle, so you know what I mean? Like it's kind of easy to visualize. Five. This is a little backhanded. It was wild seeing an amateur 2010 DeviantArt style in a book format. It's what drew me in and I can never hate something that brings up that many memories of the early internet. You know, before cringe culture took over. Whoa, oh, you posted cringe. Uh. No, like before all that, when people just drew whatever the hell they wanted. It was like the wild west of the internet. Those were my favorite years and this brings me back to them. So as much as I criticize the art in this, it's endearing to somebody who is on the early internet and it got a lot of laughs out of me and I will never consider that to be a bad thing. Number six, I liked Prince Popover's character arc even if it was kind of overdone. You know, the spoiled mama's boy who treats everyone like shit because he's a literal prince who learns he's actually kind of an asshole once he leaves the castle walls and realizes his mom would be really disappointed in how he turned out. I like that. It's sad. It's dramatic. It's character development. Just do more stuff like that with the book. I am now realizing that it, that is literally the same premise as another character I have. Okay, whatever. Moving on. What doesn't work about Royal Icing? Number one, the character motivations and attitudes are all over the place and make no sense. Do you remember all the sequences where a character will be threatening to kill another but will suddenly be all happy and jolly and then two seconds later they're mad again and then they go back to neutral after that? There are so many points in this book that confuse the hell out of me because like how, why are you fine one second and then you're just exploding the next and then you're in love with the main character and now you're mad at her again. All the characters are like this and it just, it really bothers me. Like I'll admit, I mentioned earlier, I have some wacky brain stuff that makes it hard for me to understand people's feelings, but I, uh, I don't know, it's just all over the place. I really hated reading that. It stressed me out by proxy because it just kind of reminded me of when I was like in touch with people like that and I was like, Whew. oh, that's not even the only thing that this book reminded me of that was terrible. So I'll get on with that later because number two, the sequences kind of feel like she spent forever writing this book and didn't get anything to flow properly. Well, what it seems like to me is what I did when I worked on my first graphic novel. Uh, she didn't write a plot outline and just kind of came up with stuff as she went. So scenes that should last like, you know, 30 seconds to read seem to drag on forever. And it seems like she's coming up with plot points that are supposed to go somewhere but she forgets where they go and then she just kind of like comes up with something that she thinks is better. And then that ends up going nowhere as well as the first plot point. It's 
It's as scattered as the character's emotions, and it makes it a real slog to get through. Three, none of the characters are likable. They're also mean-spirited and petty and annoying instead of seeming like well-rounded people. Which is weird because my favorite book series right now is literally only about bad people being bad constantly and never getting better. So that's saying a lot when I hate everyone in your book. If you set it up with the premise that everyone's a total piece of garbage, I'm just like, oh yeah, I can, I can get down with that. Because I like that kind of thing. But this is supposed to be like a redemption story and it's just everyone's an asshole the entire time until it ends. Four, characters are off model constantly and the backgrounds are inconsistent. You've already seen how atrocious the art is, but it honestly gets to the point where a character that looked one way two panels ago now looks completely different. Honestly, it's mostly a problem with the background characters, but the actual art style changes constantly. Additionally, in the last chapters, the artist starts putting in Shutterstock images as backgrounds converted to black and white, and that can totally be interesting. It can definitely work. That's what stock images are there for, for people to use. But if you do this for your comic, make it consistent. I hand draw all my backgrounds, and I don't usually go with like blank or pattern backgrounds. I go with scenes that I have to come up with every single time I draw a panel from different angles. And it's, it's frustrating. You have to learn how to take a lot of shortcuts. So I won't fault you for using stock images. Just make sure it's consistent the entire book instead of really sticking out like a sore thumb like it does here. And lastly, I just remembered the entire comic is in black and white, which is fine. However, the color palette isn't consistent. How do you even do that? Like, some characters will be completely different looking than how they used to look because the artist just couldn't be bothered to keep the color palette. Like, oh, the hair has screen tone on it. Nope, now the hair is black. No, now the hair is white. It's like, what? I can only tell anime characters apart by their hair. So when you're constantly screwing up the hair color, it's like, I don't know who this person is. Who is this? It's totally confusing because there's only two or three colors to remember depending on what you're doing. It's just black, white, gray. It's very simple, just keep that consistent. I guess inconsistent art is the main point here. And number five, the longest one, it doesn't feel very kid friendly. Like, I'm a million and a half percent for dark themes and kids' media. I was a weird kid, and my favorite childhood movies cause nightmares in a lot of people, so let's just say Nine, Coraline, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Monster House. Basically, just any mildly terrifying claymation movie I could get my grubby hands on. I literally sat through actual horror movies with a straight face, so I know kids can be tough and they can deal with that sort of thing since they know it's not real. But I'm not saying the book is scary, I'm just saying it has like some, there's some really inappropriate themes in it that can contribute to some unhealthy thoughts in kids. Like, can we please just talk about the scene where Emily straight up says, if you don't care about me, I will take the big L, like for real. I was joking about it earlier, but for real, I wasn't expecting to go into this kid's book and have to relive going through that in real life. It's not dramatic, it's not quirky, it's not a good plot point in a kid's book. It's kind of horrifying to impress upon children and horrifying for adults like me to flip through this unassuming book and just have to relive these emotional abuse and manipulation tactics. I am blowing this up a little bit, probably. But I did look at that and I was like, why? Like, I, I write stuff like that into my comics for the villains. And all the, all the characters are adults. It's not portrayed as a good thing. And it affects the main character for like the rest of the book. And she can't function after going through stuff like that. So seeing the stuff just kind of brushed off is like, dude. <laughs> and the themes of this kid's from a different place. Let's be shitty to her constantly. That going on as well as showing these two argumentative kids developing an on and off romantic relationship. It just, it's so volatile and unhealthy, which I am totally fine with that if it's portrayed properly, but this is not how you do it. <laughs> I'm absolutely fine with problematic content to a certain extent as long as it's portrayed as not being good. Like I said, I write all my stories about like trauma, abuse, substance abuse, isolation, mental illness, self-harm, suicide ideation, stuff like that. Since it's, it's what I know best and I feel like it's important to show people that they're not alone for going through that and it can like consume your entire life. But this is a kid's book. <laughs> This is a kid's anime book about, like, candy and crap, so I don't think that's fitting. I don't think these themes should be in this book. <sighs> just put the right labels on it. Don't make it seem justified when a character acts out like that. 
have long-lasting ramifications because that's how the human psyche works. Your brain is reprogrammed when shitty things happen to it and you start to act different. So if this was a book about like, I don't know, just being trapped in a horrible relationship in a horrifying candy world and you can't get out and it's just starting to like mess with you, that would be kind of awesome. But this book's not about that. So all this coming from somebody who's very vocal about disliking kids and I, you know, I never want any of my own. All that coming from me, that means a lot. That got really long. Let's just move on to the next bit. There's even more problematic stuff, if you would believe it. But let's just get on to the next part, which is what I would fix. <sighs> okay, what wouldn't I fix? Um, first of all, I would fix the art, obviously. But second, I think the plot is all right. It's nothing special, but it doesn't really need fixing, you know? Girl falls into a weird candy world, is framed for something she didn't do, and is tasked with finding out who actually did it. She pairs up with the guy who doesn't get along with her at first, but eventually learns to appreciate him as he gains a different worldview by proxy. Turns out, the culprit was doing what he did for the good of his mother, which is the cause of the main guy's change of heart, and he overrules his life of living by tradition alone to help this boy out when he needs it most. That's nice! I like that! It just it needs to be done much better. So many stories fall apart because the premise is good on paper, and then you like actually start writing it and you're like, oh god. I've had that happen. I've had to can so many stories. Like, when it gets to the actual execution of the story, it is much different than it appears in your head because you're thinking about the main plot points. But then you realize you have to connect them and it's like, oh god, I have to, oh. And you know what your characters are like, deep down, you know, but you need to portray that to the audience. Also, don't make Emily fall in love with him literally right away. That was super weird. I don't know if it's just my aromantic ass not understanding how relationships work. I already don't like the love at first sight trope. I hate it. And I hate it when it's done with children. That's super weird. I'm always worried about adults writing children's love stories since I don't feel like kids this young should have to worry about romantic love in the first place. So I just kind of make this like a platonic love kind of book if it were up to me. It feels kind of problematic to show a really young girl announcing that she has a crush on this slightly older verbally abusive guy. <laughs> the way I worded that, it sounds so creepy, doesn't it? And it is true. Make it a platonic thing. It's like a friendship story. Not every girl has to fall in love with the guy character, you know? Women have cool, exciting lives that don't revolve around men. Stop that. Just write a cool story about a cool lady who goes on cool adventures and doesn't rely on romantic love or any of that garbage. Just do that. Next up, I would make a plot outline for scenes so they don't feel like the writer worked on them for days and didn't read them until they were all finished. Like I said, used to do that with my first project and you can really tell with some stories that they weren't super well planned out. Maybe she did use a plot outline, but I swear I sense a lot of ad-libbing. The scenes just feel like they were written for days on end. So basically, if I were in charge of this story and I had to keep it kid-friendly, which is very difficult for me to do, I'd take out the love plot and make it more of a platonic thing. I would make the story more focused on redemption and figuring out how to relate to other people after years of isolation rather than just shit happens and resolves itself whenever it feels like it, whoa. I'd remove the ending where they meet each other in real life in college and just turn it into this kid having a weird dream but making herself a better person afterwards. You know what? I. I don't think Emily actually learned anything from any of this. I don't think she actually gained anything from the situation. She was just kind of there to be a prop that Popover falls in love with. Oh, it's so weird. So I definitely would give her some kind of lesson to take with her into the real world. Um, maybe like appreciating her mom more and setting up some kind of conflict between them in the beginning to make it pay off better. Like, oh, you forgot my birthday, even though adults really don't care about the, uh, what's a different conflict? I don't know, there's not, there doesn't seem to be a dad in the picture, so maybe, like, make something about the dad? I don't know. It just, uh, it doesn't feel as fleshed out as it could be, and maybe this story could be more focused on showing Popover, somebody who was really wounded by the loss of his mother, but eventually healing, as a reason for Emily not to take her own mom for granted while she's still alive. I think that's probably a better focus than the whole love thing, because as of now, this seems like a story more about him than it feels like it's about Emily, who's supposed to be the main character, so give her more to do instead of just being a prop. I always feel kind of bad for the person I'm talking about when I make these videos. You may be wondering why I make them in the first place, but honestly, it's just because I really love talking about bad and or weird art, not because I want to attack anybody personally or I have some kind of vendetta against them. If weird art materialized on its own and I could talk about it without the risk of hurting anybody's feelings, it'd make my job a lot easier. But in this case, this was Jury Renee's first book. It was made around 2010. 
and she seems like she's still proud of it, so honestly it does make it a bit hard to talk about. I'm gonna bring up my book again apparently, according to the script. As I mentioned in my zine making part 2 video, which isn't out yet, I made 200 pages of a graphic novel that I still love with every fiber of my being, but it's not good. Honestly, I'm not a great writer, I'm not a great artist, I'm very amateur on like every level, but ad addressing that was really hard because the love I had for that book just did not match up with the quality of the story and the execution itself. Realizing you made something that was bad is one of the most difficult things you can do as an artist, and I feel like nobody talks about it that much. This book may be terrible on a lot of levels, it's competent in some areas, and is weighed down in a lot of others, but I can admire that she's still making stuff. Is it good stuff? I don't know. Well, as of writing this script, I have no idea, but I kind of hope deep down that she knows what went wrong in the story, and is planning on doing something better for her future stuff. Right now she's writing Yuri comics, and I think they're up for free on Tapas or Webtoon, so after I'm done with this script, I'll go read those and I'll tell you what I think. But for now, I'll just say this wasn't as bad as it could have been. I hold nothing against the artist, and this was all drawn in a long time ago. But that doesn't make it immune to criticism. Especially if the artist is still advertising this book to this very day. So, you know, I, I feel bad. But, you know, not bad enough to not buy it for $2 on eBay and laugh my ass off reading through it. Maybe I'll release the first 200 pages of my graphic novel and you all can laugh your ass off at that as well if you're not bored to tears by how slow and tedious it is. Maybe I'll do a review of it in the future and it'll be pretty funny because it's like, I used to be so proud of that. You can see in my videos, I used to be proud of that book and now I'm just like, oh my god. Uh, let's just pretend that I'm just back from reading her newest book, which is Celestial Blue, and yeah, no, this book is hot garbage. I honestly came into this expecting to be blown away by the 10 years of improvement. And I'm really disappointed! I'm actually like really upset. I was hoping this would be a redemption story, you know? It's like, you made a really bad, shitty book that sucks, but you can get better, right? No! It's been 10 years, and her writing is still just as bad as it used to be, like what? What have you been doing for 10 years? Not an attack on you personally, it's just... Did nobody tell you what went wrong with the first one? That's what my job is, I guess. I came 10 years late. Here I am telling you that you really need to stop doing these things. And there's even more problems with the new one. The art is still amateurish. It looks literally the exact same as the old art. Maybe the characters are more consistent, but it's still hideous to look at. The plot is somehow less tangible than Royal Icing. Characters still have all over the place motivations. And by the end, she basically just says, Oh, go buy the book and stops it at 70 pages which i mean i understand you can't put the whole book online and expect people to buy it oh but even worse than the original um the villain's entire personality in the first 70 pages is that <laughs> is that she has an eating disorder and seems to gain powers from it so that's all she has going for her. she's just mean to everybody and is like oh well this is my whole personality i have an ed Oh, because what other personality are you going to give to a teenage girl, apparently? So, if that wasn't bad enough, it gets worse. They're high schoolers, but they look older than that, I guess. So apparently that makes it fine to write scenes where the main character is getting undressed and her little brother walks in and it goes on for like a whole page, which it has nothing to the plot and is insanely creepy. Uh, let's see. There are very distinct nipple outlines in one of the last pages, and some of the shots are under the character's skirts, so like, yeah, whatever I said about feeling bad for the creator, this is not okay, and I don't feel bad anymore. I'm sorry. Don't do this if you're drawing minors. I don't know if this was done out of ignorance or to kind of mimic anime tropes, but the thing is, this was drawn by somebody born in the same year as my mom, who was in her 40s, so personally, I don't feel like those are good excuses. Oh my god, I keep getting stressed out. It just, this is unearthing so many bad memories and it's just like, why do I have to go through this again? Let it be known that there is a book out there about sweets and kids' friendship and stuff and it somehow unearths like traumatic memories in adults. <laughs> this is what the world has come to. I didn't sign up for this. I mean, I guess I did. I signed up for anything when I picked up this book, but... Oh, this was not how I wanted to spend my day. I feel weird now, so I'm just gonna stop here before I get like actually mad because that got me really riled up, as you can tell. I hope you guys liked the video. I know it got kind of like dark and deep, 
in some places where I didn't expect it to be. I'm pretty casual about being open about stuff like that. Oh, hey Pez. She's coming to comfort me. Don't don't read that book. It's not very good. So I hope you guys can understand that's why I've been gone, that's why I haven't been responding to messages. I've seen a lot of people like, I don't care what you post, just post something. I need something to look at. And it kind of sucks that people see me as literally just like, I don't know, like it's my obligation. It's not my obligation. I don't want to do YouTube as my main thing. Because I have my own personal life, I have my own interests, YouTube is not one of my main interests. But I do it anyway because you know it's fun. But when it stops being fun, I have to step away. Sometimes that means I'm gone for months. And I'm I'm sorry I've been gone for months. I honestly am. I feel really bad about it. I had I had a video queued for February and I just didn't post it because I was like, I can't do this. I'm gonna stop there because I'm gonna keep rambling. I've been rambling a really long time. Alright, patron screen. I gotta do that. I I think I lost some patrons from inactivity, which is completely okay. I have unsubscribed from people because they haven't posted in months. But for the people who have been with me through thick and thin, I just want to say thank you for not just seeing me as somebody who posts videos sometimes. And that's my main thing. Like, they actually care about my art, apparently, if they stuck around this long. So that means a lot to me. It was really weird getting this deep in a video about fucking royal icing, of all things. Um... Oh, I still have to do the thing where I'm like, subscribe for more unrelated topic. Like and subscribe for more infinite Roblox hacks. Wait, I think I think I already did that one. Like and subscribe for more Roblox map making tutorials. Yeah! This video didn't end off badly at all.